Welcome to Mrs. True Crime. Today's video is an in-depth look into the nightmares deaths of Brian Edgar and Adrian Jones. It's a tale of rage and cruelty. If you are triggered by anything dealing with tortured children, feel free to click off this video. Perhaps check out my gaming channel, We Tell Me Games, for some lighthearted content. If not, I'm Nicole. Let's get started. I'm not a parent. I don't know anything about parenting, but I like to think I had some pretty awesome guardians growing up. They instilled in me the need to always be kind, that what you put out to the world you get back, and never bite the hand that feeds you. Okay, so I grew up on a lot of cliches, but I was fortunate enough to always have a roof over my head, food in my stomach, and clothes on my back. Sadly, not a lot of people can say they grew up like that. Even worse, some don't even grow up. Brian Edgar and Adrian Jones didn't get a chance to become a teenager. They didn't always have clothes on their backs, roofs over their heads, or food in their stomachs. And it wasn't because their parents couldn't provide for them, it was because their parents simply didn't want to. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, it says, But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Christy and Neil Edgar were ordained ministers who created their own church in Kansas City, Kansas in 1992. The two-story building named God's Creation Outreach Ministry housed 70 plus members and was aligned with the Church of God in Christ. The church's intentions were to help people overcome their problems by encouraging open and honest communication, something the Eggers knew a lot about. The couple grew up together and married in 1972. And together, they had two biological children. But soon, the threat of marriage started to wane, and in 1979, Christy filed for divorce, listing fear of receiving bodily harm in hands of husband. She then got a restraining order. The divorce would never happen. The couple would undergo financial troubles for failing to make payments and back taxes. Soon, family troubles would follow, with Neil's older brother being shot in the head, trying to protect their sister and Neil Jr. serving 30 years in Missouri prison for committing murder in 2000. For the Eggers, their church was their only source of stability. The way the couple managed the church is based on perspective. A few onlookers and preachers in the area thought God's creation was more of a cult than a Christian congregation, noting the Eggers refused to intermingle churches, was too strict with children, leaving one child in time out for an hour, and not allowing any Christian leader to have any contact with their members. While on the other side of things, the church members thought the Eggers were a strong support system and would do anything for their members, including allow them to live in one of the five homes the couple owned. The opinions of others didn't matter to the Eggers unless they were trying to adopt children. Over time, the couple had taken in foster children, most were from relatives, but four of them would be theirs. They range in ages of 9 to 16, with Brian Edgar being one of the youngest. Brian's records are sealed, so not much is known about him prior to being adopted by the Edgars, but what was known was how the couple handled insubordinate children. The couple led by example in their strictness with children, whether their own or otherwise. Reasons for punishment ranged from taking water from a faucet without permission to not paying attention in church. The punishment, which involved tying the children up and leaving them, came from Christy, who believed God gave her the ideas to do so, and the members of both her family and church believed this. They often assisted in punishing children on Christy's orders. She used extension cords, belts, and duct tape to tie the children as well as placing clear tape over the children's mouths so they wouldn't cry out. The way the children were tied up varied. Sometimes their hands were tied behind their backs, other times, their hands were tied to their feet with a scarf over their eyes. On one occasion, Christy's nine-year-old foster daughter was hogtied and placed in a dry bathtub. On another, Brian was tied crucifix-style to a bunk bed. Both were left overnight. On the night of December 29, 2002, 
the Eggert children were being babysat by Chastity Boyd, a member of the church for 12 years, when Brian innocently took a cookie from the kitchen without permission. Chastity left a note for Christy, telling of Brian's misdeeds. When Christy returned home, the two of them wrapped duct tape around Brian, but ran out when they got to his waist. Christy and Neil went out to get more, and then Christy and Chastity continued to wrap the tape until it covered his head, leaving only enough space that he could breathe through his nose. His mouth was then stuffed with a sock that Neil would later say he put tape across to keep Brian quiet. He was then placed in the cellar overnight. When they went to check on him, the following morning he was unresponsive. The couple, with the help of their other foster children, removed the tape and Neil took him to the hospital. But it was too late. Brian was dead. The official cause of death was asphyxiation. Brian had suffocated on his own vomit. The autopsy would also show that he'd been dead for hours and had bruises on his cheeks and a few old marks on his wrists and ankles, similar to rope marks. All three were arrested, along with five members of their church. Chrissy Egger pled guilty to first-degree murder before a trial began and was sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole in 20 years. Neil Edgar and Chastity Boyd received the same sentence, but then added 32 months for abuse of two other children. Neil would seek an appeal in 2012, but lose. Patricia Walker and Renita Allen Jackson, two of the five members accused, received 13 months and 26 months, respectively, of community corrections for their role in abusing the three of the four Edgar Foster children. Adela A. Horton was sentenced to 13 months probation. Barbara Clark was also sentenced probation. Brian Edgar was laid to rest January 9, 2003 by his former foster parents, Sister Peg Driscoll and Sister Anna Mary Lawrence. The remaining foster children were placed in protective custody. You're shivering. You think somehow your body would grow accustomed to the cold, but instead it's betraying you, getting weaker and weaker. It's probably because you haven't eaten in who knows how long. You wonder if you'll ever remember the taste of a McDonald's cheeseburger, or if you'll ever get to taste one again. It's dark around you, pitch black. You blink a few times, but it only gets darker. You can barely hold your head up, let alone your body. You can see your ribs. You can see every bone and vein that makes you, you. You rest, or try to, against the cold hard tile of a bathroom shower that's been boarded up with plywood. You close your eyes and hope to feel free again. That's how I can only assume seven-year-old Adrian Jones felt after nine months of torture from his father and stepmother who left him to die in the shower of their master bathroom. And after two weeks of living with his decompensing body, Adrian's father, Michael Jones, bought six feeder pigs and threw his only son's body into the pen. For all accounts, Adrian Jones was a lively and curious boy who always had a smile on his face but others would notice how he clung to anyone who wasn't his parents. The fifth of six children born to Dana Pierce and the first of seven children born to Michael Jones in Kansas, Adrian's upbringing was dysfunctional. Pierce was always gone, Michael at times was frightening, and older sister Kiana, aka Kiki, which is about the only adult Adrian and his siblings knew. After a while, Kansas Department for Children and Families, DCF, got involved, finding lack of supervision on Pierce's part, and Michael Jones obtained custody of Adrian and his other two siblings born to Pierce, which was convenient, seeing as Michael had started an affair with Heather Coon and was looking to start anew anyhow. The two would get married and have four daughters of their own. The family would appear healthy and happy, but there was a dark undertone that some couldn't put their finger on. In July 2012, Michael registered their home as a non-accredited private school creatively named Jones Academy. Not much is known about the events that happened in that home during this time, but almost exactly a year later in July 2013, two anonymous tips would bring the Jones Academy to light. At some point, the family had moved from Kansas to Plattsburgh, Missouri, and someone had caught whiff of the chaos that followed. The first tip stated that Adrian was being abused, and the conditions of the house wasn't up to code. But an investigation from the Missouri Department of Social Services found the claim unsupported. Four months later, another tip would come in claiming that Heather beat her children and sold meth out of the home. This investigation led to an interview with Adrian, who was five at the time, detailing how Michael kicked him in the head so harshly, bone would come out, how Heather pulled on his ears, and how the two didn't feed him and locked him in his room alone. 
Heather defended her actions, saying that Adrian had been hospitalized twice and suffered unspecified mental health issues. She claimed the five-year-old threatened to kill her and harm his sisters, trying to start fires in their bathroom. The Children's Division of Social Services got in contact with Clinton County Juvenile, asking if they could take custody of the boy, but the county instead insisted on intensive in-home services. After two weeks, Michael and Heather stopped cooperating and moved across state lines to Kansas City, Kansas. The case was eventually closed. In Kansas City, the abuse only intensified. Judy Conway, Adrian's grandmother, wanted to see her grandson desperately. The last time she saw Adrian was Christmas 2012, and that wasn't enough for her, but Michael always seemed to have an excuse. In 2014, he called Conway out of the blue, saying that Adrian, now six, was in a psychiatric hospital because he had turned into a pedophile and was developing sexual tendencies. The hospital reports would later say that Adrian was lively and curious, but his behavior would change significantly when Heather or Michael would enter the room. Still, the couple were allowed to take him home. Around this time, they had a new home and a new landlady in the form of Jennifer Hovers. Jennifer thought the family was nice, though she thought the surveillance cameras around the home was a bit much, but Michael was a bail bondsman, so she figured it came with a job. If only she knew just what kind of job Michael truly had. Starting around May 2015, Michael and Heather began to starve Adrian. He'd get oatmeal while his sisters had McDonald's until eventually they stopped feeding him altogether. As the months grew on, starvation just wasn't enough of a torture for the Joneses. They began to strap Adrian to an inversion table where his legs would swell from the pressure. He would be forced to strip naked and stay in stagnant water up to his neck overnight. His hands were handcuffed behind his back and he was left in the dark and cold outside to fend for himself. Boards were strapped to his chest so he wouldn't bend over. His lips were swollen and bleeding from trying to gnaw at his plywood showered prison and he was hit across the face with a broomstick. Heather would taser him for 15 to 20 seconds at a time, and if all of that wasn't enough for this small boy, his parents taped and documented all of it. In one photo, Heather had took a photo of the shower like a prize she'd won. There were notes to unknown sources dating back to 2012 from Heather saying how she strapped the boy down and left him. Yet the most gut-wrenching part of it all was that they almost got away with it. Kiki had reason to be scared of Michael, and on the day before Thanksgiving 2015, Heather called police that Michael had taken a shot at her. When police arrived, Heather cried out for them to search the barn, and when they did, they found what was left of the small seven-year-old. At some point, Heather had called her father and calmly told him that Michael killed Adrian and it'll be on the news. And for the most part, she was right. Michael was charged with aggravated battery and aggravated assault for shooting at Heather, and the case against Adrian was underway. But the police also arrested Heather. While awaiting trial, Heather told their landlady her password to her laptop in order to print off photos of her children, but what Jennifer wasn't expecting was pictures among pictures of a small child slowly losing hope. Heather had pleaded guilty to abuse and was sentenced to life without parole for 25 years, so it was too late to use the photos for her, but not Michael. Michael pled guilty and was given the same sentence as Heather, but in November 2017, he wanted to appeal his conviction and go to trial. As of yet, there hasn't been word on whether or not Michael would get one. Meanwhile, Judy Conway, Kiki Doctors, and Dana Pierce filed a $25 million lawsuit for punitive damages citing that nothing was done by DCF for Adrian when it should have been. But DCF isn't the only ones to blame. Willie Flowers, Michael's uncle, also lived and babysat with the Joneses during the abuse and said and did nothing. Kansas law states that only mandatory reporters, such as teachers and doctors, are required to report abuse or neglect. But state rep Louise Ruse has introduced Adrian's Act that requires adults living in a home where a child is being abused to report to authorities. There's been no word on whether the law has passed or not. Adrian was laid to rest in late 2017 by his grandmother and family. Brian Edgar and Adrian Jones only wanted to be loved and cared for, but instead they were hurt in ways no one could even imagine. What did these two little boys do to deserve the severity of their torment? If Brian and Adrian were alive, they'd be 24 and 9, respectively. I wonder where they'd be today had their lives been different. 
I'm not a religious person, but I'll leave you with this from Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it will be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I miss a true crime, and remember to be kind, be loud, be aware. For more information about Brian Edgar and Adrian Jones, why not check out some of these awesome links? And if you like what you saw and heard today, why not drop a like and a comment? Maybe subscribe while you're here? <laughs> I make new videos every Tuesday and Friday, and you don't want to miss what's in store.